Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. The first act of the Copa del Rey Clasico has taken shape, with Barcelona taking a slender lead thanks to a Militao own goal. It was a tense first leg that leaves the second leg in the balance. But what tactics did we see on display from Xavi and Carlo Ancelotti? Let's take a look. And we'll begin by looking at what Barcelona did on the ball and Real Madrid's ever-changing pressing shape. From open play, Barcelona were using Araujo as a more traditional right-back compared to the right centre-back we often see him tuck in to become when Barca are on the ball. And early on, Real Madrid were looking to press high up the pitch and were looking to go man-to-man -man in midfield, with Modric pressing Busquets and Camavinga and Kroos taking care of the other midfielder. Interestingly, Benzema would often press one centre-back and Valverde's role in the press, especially in the first half, was not to stay wide, but instead to aggressively look to close down Alonso, so that both centre-backs and Alonso in particular were under pressure as much as possible. And this was a very deliberate ploy by Ancelotti, as if Barcelona had played with a traditional shape, if they had been able to go out wide, it would have meant a 2 versus 1 against Carvajal. But Ancelotti was aware of the fact that Gavi was only a winger on paper, and would look to invert inside as early as he could, so that meant that there was only one man wide on the left in most situations. So Carvajal's role was to aggressively press Balde in this first phase, so that if he received, he was under pressure and it would be too difficult for him to progress up the pitch. Initially, the Real Madrid midfield is roughly man-to-man -man with Barcelona's own midfield three, and Valverde is fairly deep and narrow. But as soon as he gets the opportunity, he is looking to close down Alonso, and as much as possible, Carvajal backs up this press onto Balde, making it difficult to progress. On the rare occasions where we did see Gavi staying wider, Militao was more than happy to cover a cross, and this is because even if Gavi got on the ball, he couldn't exactly get past Militao on pure pace or skill alone, so Militao was comfortable with these 1v1 situations. In fact, the couple of occasions where Real Madrid looked more vulnerable in this pressing shape was when Carvajal was slow to press Balde, because when Balde has time to face up his man, he's quite dangerous with his pace and skill. So if Carvajal was deep, it would give Balde time to build up a head of steam. We see the same pressing shape with Valverde high, and Balde has a bunch of space, as Carvajal has stayed deep, so he is able to get on the ball. This now means it's a midfielder in Camavinga who has to try and come across before now Carvajal joins in on the press late. So with one less midfielder, Barcelona can then look to work the ball to Gavi. And he looks to make the pass through. But what was interesting is that in the first half, when Gavi was inverting, it was not into midfield regions, but instead it was fairly high up, almost into the front line. Perhaps Xavi was not anticipating for Carvajal and Valverde to be pressing in this shape, and instead anticipating that he would be looking to tuck in to track Gavi when he moved in central, and this, as we've seen in recent matches, would have left a whole bunch of space for Balde to attack when Carvajal was drawn in, leading to more dangerous situations. But by keeping Carvajal wide and Valverde more central, Militao could immediately look to pick up Gavi. But what we did see on very rare occasions was a potential weakness here, as if Gavi was able to draw Militao out of position, it would create space for Torres to potentially run in behind, but on this day it was ineffective. So here again we see Valverde pressing the centre-back, and Carvajal is caught in two minds on whether to follow Gavi or go out towards Balde, and Militao maintains his usual role of looking to pick up Gavi. Torres is already pointing towards the space that will be created. So, there would have been a massive gap to attack, but Militao brings down Gavi. In the second half, we saw both teams shift their shape a little more, as Gavi, rather than always inverting high, was much more willing to tuck into midfield regions, and this would help to potentially create potential 4 versus 3s. But what we also saw was a shift in Valverde's role, as rather than pressing centrally against the centre-backs, he started much wider as a more traditional midfielder, but would often tuck into the centre of the pitch, looking to cover the passing lane to Gavi patrolling behind the lines, and ensuring it was difficult for Barcelona to progress through the centre. But Real Madrid had a lot more of the ball, so what tactical patterns allowed that? Throughout the match, the flanks were a big strategy for Real Madrid, and in the first half, the left-hand side in particular looked dangerous. Much like Real Madrid, 
Barcelona's own midfield was looking to go man-to-man -man in most situations. And Real Madrid had a few different ways of looking to create an overload, particularly on the left-hand side. Firstly, we could see Camavinga and Kroos form more of a traditional double pivot, and Modric had a lot more freedom, operating as an attacking midfielder at times, and he could drift all the way to the left-hand side to initiate an overload, but more likely we saw Benzema dropping into this region on occasion, as he loves to do. And actually, perhaps being wary of this left-hand side overload, Rafinha was fairly disciplined in the defensive phase, often dropping so deep he looked somewhat like a right wing back, allowing Araujo to help make the centre much more compact. But Real Madrid had various ways of drawing Rafinha out to free up Vinicius. The first is that Nacho was fairly adventurous with his positioning, looking to push higher up the pitch. So when he received, Rafinha would naturally be drawn out, giving Vinicius these potential one versus ones against Araujo. But what we could also see on occasion is that of course Real Madrid's midfield is great at maintaining possession, so Kroos could occasionally find space on this left hand side much deeper and Rafinha would be drawn towards him to apply pressure and not allow him to dictate the game too easily, again resulting in the outball to Vinicius and a 1v1 against Araujo. Rafinha is deeper, allowing Araujo to tuck in as he has one eye on Vinicius behind him. But as you can see, this also means that Nacho is in a ton of space. So now Rafinha was drawn higher up the pitch to one of the men and Araujo is still tucked in, meaning Vinicius is free to receive, leading to a one-on-one. -on -one. And we know Vinicius is great at 1v1s, but Araujo is also pacey and excellent at defending them. And due to Nacho's lack of athleticism to get outside of him, and Kroos tending to stay deeper to dictate play rather than pushing right up into the half space, as we often see Modric do on the other side, meant that Vinicius could at times look isolated. And even the great dribblers need some support now and then. This wasn't helped by Busquets also coming in to assist Araujo, making it difficult for Vinicius to truly get past his man. And down the right, Real Madrid still looked to take advantage, as the left-hand side overloads could force the Barcelona defence across to try and cover and we saw that throughout the second half in particular, Carvajal was often the free man. And if Kroos got time on the ball, he would look for the switch to Carvajal, either to go for the cross, or even at times, Carvajal was found in the box, leading to much more danger. But even as early as the first half, we saw Real Madrid looking to take advantage of the space between Alonso and Balde with midfield runners, be it Valverde or Modric, who would both look to attack, especially when Carvajal received the ball, drawing Balde out. And here we see a typical situation that transpired in the second half, with Carvajal often giving the width, all on the right-hand side. This presence was exaggerated in the second half, because where in the first half Valverde could start wider, in the second he committed to being the most attacking of the midfield. And in fact, he would often receive between the lines, draw the defence in more central, and free Carvajal to receive on the outside. In addition, a midfielder could also drop deeper to make this right-hand side overload even more powerful, as Militao would often get on the ball in these regions, drawing Gavi higher, with the aim still being to overload Alonso and Balde on this left-hand side. But in the second, Barcelona were content to hold on to their lead, and we saw them defend quite compactly, giving up almost all of the width on the pitch. And this was partly because Carvajal on the right-hand side, and with Vinicius tucking in, Nacho, and later Camavinga when he switched to the left-back, were not very dangerous when they did receive out wide, be it with their crossing or 1v1 situations, so Barcelona's focus was on making sure these dangerous central men did not get onto the ball in good positions. The tie remains finely balanced, and a month from now, these sides will do battle once again in this competition. Xavi will be delighted taking a lead back home, but Ancelotti's men have been known to launch a comeback or two. But what did you think of the match? Drop it down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might enjoy the content available on my Patreon. Not only does Patreon help to support the continued production of content, as I am a one-man team, but it also gives you early access to videos that will come on the channel. You'll also get exclusive videos, get to vote on polls, and so much more, and it's cheaper than ever, no longer having a tier system, so everyone on the Patreon gets access to all the content.
So head over to patreon.com slash football made simple to check it out. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.